Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very accomplished professional from Indiana, USA, Jody Grunden. Jody, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Jody is the co-founder and CEO of Summit CPA. He's been recognized, awarded, and felicitated globally. So, Jody, let's talk about accounting. Let's talk about Summit CPA. Okay. Uh, tell me about the venture and uh, what made you start off your own firm? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, you know it, it, it really kind of it really kind of pigtails on how you know where, where the firm is at today. I started in in you know with a with a couple of large accounting firms initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, worked a lot of long hours. You know, really was in the grind. You know, what they call it. And busy season was one of those things you just kind of every year you, you pretty much get sick because mm-hmm. you know your 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 anxiety is getting you know, catching up to how many hours you're going to be working in. Right. And it was one of those things I, I just didn't want to do any longer. So I, I left public accounting and went to, to work in, in private. So I worked for a $250 million manufacturing company. I, I ran the, um, the billing and the uh, taxes. I, basically, I, you know, I was their tax manager for the most part. Mm-hmm. And, and it was really exciting at first. You know, a lot of, you know, it was new, new venture. But after a while, it got pretty boring. It was pretty much like a groundhog day over and over and over and right. over again. So right. It, was, it, it just wasn't long term for me. And I thought, well, you know what, I want to I want to get back into, I think, public accounting. And I had opportunities to work for the big four. And I'm like, man, do I want to get back into that? I thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to start my own thing. And uh, with that, I got an opportunity to run an office for a small firm mm-hmm. uh, and kind of get my feet wet. And, and it really wasn't something I, I, I decided, you know, I can't really work for somebody. I've got to be, the, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm unemployable, I guess, as, as you would mm-hmm. say, for other entrepreneur. And so That's I thought, you know, I got to start my own. So about a year later, I started my own firm. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things that I wanted to do things a lot differently. Uh, I didn't want my team to work, you know, because I, I, I had the divisions. Even when I started my own firm, it was a firm of one. You know, at that point, I was a firm of two because I hired my um, my now partner, uh, Adam Hale. Was, you know, I hired him right out of college and he came along with me. And it was basically a, a firm of two, mm-hmm. uh, no clients. And, uh, you know, with that, you know, I wanted to do things differently. I, I wanted to I wanted to do things where the hours weren't you know a big you know pet. I, I didn't want to have our team working forty hours a week you know, sure. you know over forty hours mm-hmm. hours. I wanted them to work in a regular lifestyle. I wanted to do things differently in the way we dressed. You know, mm-hmm. back then, uh, twenty years ago in two thousand two, everybody wore suits and ties, and mm-hmm. it was like you know what we we made fun of those folks. You know, when they came in and we did the audit when I was working in manufacturing, and I would, we call them suits. And it's like well. Uh, I didn't want to be a suit, so I thought, well, let's let's, let's dress, dress dress down to our our base and our clientele, make them feel more comfortable right. around us, be on their playing level. And then the other thing was is that I didn't want to work and build by the hour. I wanted to do something a lot different and something that hadn't been done before, or at least I was aware of at the time. And uh, you know, with that, uh, that's where subscription based billing came into play, and I kind of changed the. The way that we actually did billing, and so it was a kind of a couple of different things and foundations, but it really all started from, you know, not you know not not really liking the long hours. You know, I coached hockey, and hockey is a is obviously a, a winter sport, mm-hmm. and it happened to be right at the start of our busy season, and it was one of those things that if I was going to coach, you know, I had to put the time in for that, but it also would take time away, and I wouldn't be able to. Mm-hmm. work a bazillion hours during you know the tax season i didn't feel wow. as fair for our team with those hours if if i wasn't you know willing to put in those hours amazing so you know uh, if you look at the the accounting function over the last four decades from an accountant to a chief accountant uh, to today the very high powered cfo mm-hmm. uh, how has in your opinion the function evolved and changed over the over the decades. Yeah, that, that's a great question because with with what we call you know because we we, uh, we we basically use the term virtual CFO and we use that and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different companies. If you were if you were to pull all the uh, you know the accounting firms out there, they'd probably have a different definition of what mm. that means. Uh, what that means to us mm. is that. You know, it's the strategic, the forward thinking. Uh, it's not the the bill paying, the accounting, the 
uh, invoicing. It's not that. Uh, yeah. That's about a third of what we do. That's kind of the back office accounting. The mm -hmm. CFO or the virtual CFO side of it, the strategic side. Right. And the nice thing about what, what's kind of evolving right now is that the bigger firms, the bigger companies have always had the opportunity or has had the availability of having a CFO mm -hmm. on their team, many CFO, you know, CFO, many high level accountants on their teams where they could get the forecast and the strategy, the, right. the cost and everything done at the high level. Mm -hmm. And the smaller firms, which is the majority of, well, the smaller companies, which is the majority of all the companies mm -hmm. um, really didn't have the, the funds or the availability for that. And so what we tried to do is we try to bring that CFO level mentality to the smaller firms to really help them grow. So instead of paying bills and doing stuff like that, the focus is really on modeling, you know, hey, if we're going to hire three people, how is that going to impact not only revenue and taxes, but how is that going to impact my cash position three, four months from now? You know, what's the long term view? You know, what if I do price increases? You know, what's that going to hit to my bottom margin? How's that going to increase my cash? If I'm, you know, all the different things that small businesses go through, and they're usually just kind of plugging and chugging, hoping that they're being, you know, hoping they're making the right decision. That's where that virtual CFO um, is really coming into play and really helping them, you know, be, be alongside them. It's kind of nice because we have clients that, that contact us all the time because we, we have set meetings, right? We're meeting with the client on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. We're part of the team. You know, the team knows us, you know, we're, we're on first name basis. When it, and when, you know, when those issues come up that really kind of keep the, the, the business owner up at night, you know, they, they give us a buzz, you know, they'll call us or text us mm -hmm. or Slack us or whatever means. And, you know, hey, am I doing the right decision? Is this the right way of doing it? Should I be thinking of anything else? And it's nice to have that partner uh, mm -hmm. that can really kind of help them, you know, get through those hurdles, you know, because those hurdles a lot of times will stunt growth, you know, because change is tough for a lot of people. And when you hire one person, that's, that's a tough, tough decision because it's changing the way you're doing hiring 10 people, tough decision, mm. but it's nice to have that person that can really kind of sit Got beside the, the owner of the business and, and help them through those decisions. Fascinating. And uh, how is technology changing accountant? You know, I remember when I was growing up um, 42, 43 years ago, we didn't even have computers and there used to be manual ledgers and so on and so forth. And now we are talking, you know, blockchains, you know, yeah. and talking a whole lot of other kinds of technology. What is your perspective on how the function has changed in terms of technology? Oh, technology is a huge part of change. You know, right, right now there's three pillars, right? You've got people, processes, and technology. All three have to be really working in harmony when it comes to, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you've got a solid company or a solid firm. Um, you know, and it's no different from the small firms versus the large firms. You know, with, with our firm, for instance, we're fully remote. We've been that way since 2013, 2014. And, uh, you know, the only way we could do that is really, really leveraging technology. Because right. uh, back then it wasn't a normal. You know, now with the, with the pandemic and everything, people are used to working from home. That really wasn't the case two years ago. And technology has always been kind of the, the forefront. You know, plus the way that I think the global market's working right now is that you know, price, you know, people want to buy a service, you know, they want to, they don't want to buy hours. Mm -hmm. You know, so like when, for instance, if, if you're, if you're hiring, you know, me to, to come and do something, I'm going to say, Hey, it's going to be X amount of dollars, mm -hmm. you know, no matter how long it takes me to get it done. Right. And what that does that forces firms to figure out how to be profitable within whatever that dollar amount is. Mm -hmm. And technology is huge for that. Okay. You know, just different softwares that, that, that our team uses, you know, now versus when they, you know, five mm -hmm. years ago, it saves them hours on hours of time. Mm -hmm. And when you take those hours and hours of time, multiply it by 150 clients a month, it, it, it equals real money, it equals right. real people capacity. So technology is really, really huge. And you've got to be able to embrace technology in the world today in order to be able to get to that next step. Fascinating. And my next question to you is that, you know, you've spoken about outsourcing, you've spoken about the virtual CFO. What would you say are the top three or four reasons for someone to outsource to Summit CPA? Yeah, I would say not only outsource to Summit CPA, but outsource to any of the, uh, the firms right now that are trying to really get into this market because there's a lot. And again, the more firms that we have out there that are providing this level of service is really going to breed excellence. It's going to breed uh, competition is going to be, you know, a lot of different innovative, you know, ideas. And so, you know, why would somebody, you know, come to us, you know, before I would say these last, this last year or so, the, the, our biggest competition has always been the internal person. So do I hire somebody internally to do the job, you know, or do I hire some CPA group? Because at that point, 
we were one of the only firms that were actually providing this level of service. And with that, it was always, you know, we could always prove to them that, hey, it's going to be a lot cost effective. We've got a team that works on the account versus just one person. Mm -hmm. So when, when they come to Summit, you not only get the CFO, but you get the back office uh, senior level accounting team that's crunching the numbers, that's really helping out. In the event somebody gets sick or, or goes on vacation, somebody else can step in. And then right. you've got a wide you know, variety of account uh, CFOs that can leverage ideas off of each other to really kind of help a client. So you know, it, it was one of those things that was very easy. Now, now it's kind of different. It's kind of uh, unique. Over the last probably six months, things have changed a little bit. We're, mm -hmm. we're actually getting firms that when we're quoting bids and everything, you know, we're actually having other companies, you know, other accounting firms that are in the space and really trying to work it out. And, and that's pretty exciting because it's, it's just, it's, it's really cool that the, the whole, basically the industry itself is, is kind of morphing a little bit and getting away from the compliance work and really getting into the strategy. Uh, because again, that's why clients come to us, right? They want the forecasting, they want the modeling, they want that person to sit alongside them when they're having the, you know, the, the big, the big issue or the big question or the big concern, you know, that's, that's why they come to us. And it's cool that the whole industry is changing so that it's going to be more of a norm versus an exception. Wonderful. And you must have worked with dozens of, or even more CFOs as an observer, uh, you know, of CFOs, what would you say are some of the key qualities a CFO should have? Yeah, the first thing you think is, well, they need to know accounting. And, well, okay, that, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of, you have to have that in order to, to get in the arena, right? So it, you, we, we, when we actually look for CFOs that bring on the team, for instance, we don't necessarily look at their accounting background. You know, we don't look at their grades. We don't look at what school they came from. We don't look at any of that. What we look for is it's somebody that can actually communicate well with the client. And the reason why we say that is because the CFO's main job is to be alongside that person, mm -hmm. give them good news, give them bad news, be able to read the, the individual, mm -hmm. meaning to be able to react, you know, against their emotions to know exactly, you know, how you need to deliver this type of message to make sure that it gets through to them and doesn't, you know, just kind of go right over their head mm -hmm. and somebody that can it really speak at the level of the client. So it, it's, it's a lot of soft skills when it comes down to it. It's, mm -hmm. a, lot of, it's a lot of the, you know, the communication because communication is, is, is key especially in the world today, communication. If you're alongside somebody and you're, and you're the CFO, you can knock on the door and you can go into their office. It's a little different than when you're virtually, you know, mm -hmm. when you're outside of that. You've got to have strong communication. So communication is hugely important. Follow through is really important. Um, you know, making sure that they, they address questions quickly and, and get concerns taken care of. You know, so there's a lot of the, again, the soft skills are the big mm -hmm. uh, things that we look for. I, you know, like I said, knowing accounting and finance is just part of it. Uh, right. But it's really kind of a small part of it. You know, we, we assume that that person has those abilities. Mm -hmm. And then we look for, hey, can they communicate to the clients? And again, are the clients going to want them on their team? Mm, fascinating. Uh, my next question to you, Jody, is that across the world, the big accounting firms have been under a lot of pressure. Um, what, in your opinion, is the reason for this pressure? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, you know, not having worked in a, in a big, big accounting firm like that, that mm -hmm. it, it's the, the, the biggest pressures I think is just the, the, the accounting is really changing. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of the, you know, a lot of the bigger companies or bigger firms are, are trying to figure out, hey, how can we maintain our people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people out there, they're a number one asset. Mm -hmm. You know, so how can we make, how can we change the way that they feel comfortable coming into work? You know, the, the 80 hour work weeks, you know, those are going to be probably a thing of the past here fairly quickly, mm -hmm. if not starting, you know, that, that rotation down. So they got to figure out how can we actually change our structure in order to be, you know, to, to be, be, be profitable. But mm -hmm. in the same part, looking at our people and making sure that they don't want to leave because it's a lot easier to work for somebody next door that's not, mm -hmm. that doesn't have that same you know, commitment. You know, other things is, again, the strategy is a, another big part. You know, getting away from, hey, this is compliance work, really talking about historical information mm -hmm. and, you know, auditing and that sort of thing versus, hey, the strategy part, which is a completely different, mm -hmm. um, different beast form. You know, they're not used to, to be providing the strategy that they would. And it's, again, it's a different type of, uh, different type of accounting. So if it, a, a, per, a smaller firm looking up to the bigger firms, that's what I would think that they're having, that they're struggling with right now is trying to figure out how we can make the new norm, you know, mm -hmm. fit their model so it doesn't really hurt their model in the long run. Very interesting. 
So, you know, when I was reading about you, uh, you may you state that you believe that a well-run company will thrive in a good and a bad economy. Help me understand this with an example or an anecdote. Yeah, that's a great, great. Yeah, when, when looking at that, when, when I always look at if the company has everything working for them, uh, economic factors shouldn't really be a huge impact on their on their success. Now, that doesn't hold true in every single instance, but I would say for the majority of it, it, it does. And what I mean by that is that mm-hmm. if, a, if a company is well capitalized, which is really important, and I say that a service-based business should have at least 10% of their annualized revenue in the bank at all times. So if you're a million-dollar company, you should have $100,000 sitting in the bank. And... Uh, you know, people wonder why would I need that kind of money in the bank? You know, I, I've never had the, I never needed that before. It's like, well, because if something happens, you know, a, a, a pandemic, you know, can't predict that, you know, it's, it's a, a devastating issue that comes up, you know, something unpredictable happens, you've got time to make decisions. And what happens when you don't have that, those, that, that, that time, because cash will, will give you that time, mm-hmm. uh, then you start making really bad decisions. You know, you make decisions based on, fear, you make, you know, emotion starts taking over and you start really getting into really some risky, risky decisions there. And so what, what I mean by that is that if you've got, if you've got cash in the bank, you're not going to go broke, you know, because you've got cash in the bank, you've got, and, and you basically, and you can actually look in, in, in your terminal factors, if all your metrics, all your key metrics are, mm-hmm. are going the way they should be, if you're leveraged perfectly with people, if you're leveraged per, per revenue, you've got your revenue growth. You've got your cash, you got your AR taken care of. Mm-hmm. All the different accounting functions are going well. R- really, the cash is what's the key on preventing you know, something like that happen. So we, we say two months to six months of cash, which is mm-hmm. generally 10% to 30% of your annualized revenue. Again, that's for a service-based company. Should be in the, in, in the bank. And if you have that money, well, you can actually sit back and reflect and make decisions on a slower scale. Um, you know, I, I really think any... Any business can thrive in in, 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 that, in that type of economy. That's it. So I've got time for a few more questions. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that you were working, you work with, of course, large companies, foundations. I'm not sure if you work with startups. Uh, you probably do. What, in your opinion, are some of the differences in accounting I'm not saying that we're going to have to balance, you know, balance the balance sheet, et cetera, but given the structure of organizations and maturity of organizations, what in your view uh, is, uh, or how, how should you as a CPA look at accounts of these different companies? Yeah, great, great question. So smarter, smaller companies, when they start out, typically they have a, a bookkeeper or um, it, it, the owners, the, the accountant, you know, never been an accountant before, but the owners, the accountant type of thing. And, and the accounting is kind of the afterthought, you know, the accounting is the, you know, Hey, it's, it's a necessity in order to have good you know, financial, financial yeah. information to pay mm-hmm. taxes or whatever. Uh, it's not the driving force. And as the business starts to mature, okay. uh, the accounting doesn't necessarily become that factor, but other things, but how to understand the accounting mm-hmm. is, is the part that really, uh, starts allowing that uh, that company to grow, you know, from you know, you know, one or two people to you know, 15, 20 people to a million dollars or above, or whatever the dollar, whatever the dollar might, might dollar might be, is kind of insignificant. But as the, as the accounting matures, the owners are taking more of a you know, basically their understanding of what really makes their company make money. Right. Because a lot of times, you know, people don't realize what makes their company make money. They just think, well, it's been making money. It's been doing well. Mm-hmm. I've been pricing well. I'm in the black all the time. I'm, it must be really doing well. In reality, they're kind of been flat and kind of, you know, really growth hasn't been, you know, anything that they can actually look at. Mm-hmm. When they start actually focusing on and flipping the accounting over and saying, hey, what did I do today mm-hmm. that in, that's going to impact tomorrow? How can I make that change? Or am I okay with that? Mm-hmm. And so now they're starting to look, start to look forward. And when they start looking forward, that's when they really start to see their, their, their business start to really change mm. and, and then change for the good. You know, allow, you know, growth is really a good thing because it allows, you know, allows team members to get raises and do fun stuff for the team and, you know, all that kind of good stuff outside of, you know, profits and so forth. But growth is great. And, and with that, you know, you really have to kind of look forward in order to be able to get to that growth um, it because, you know, it's just like, you know, if you've got a, if you got a map, you know, if you got a map, it's really easy to go from point A to point B. Mm. If I could actually drive, 
you know, I can drive from north to south. I'm going to eventually hit an ocean sometime, right? <laughs> you know, okay. it's going to happen eventually, no matter where I'm at in the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, with that, but it's a lot easier to get to that ocean if I know all the different roadblocks in between, mm-hmm. where everything's at, the detours, where there's roads, where there's not, you know, what, yeah. you know, what I have to take a ferry or, or instead of a boat, you know, mm-hmm. instead of a car or instead of a bike or whatever that might be. But, you know, it, 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 that forecast is what allows you to get that, those options to be able to, to work around the obstacles to get to, you know, to get to the destination you want to get. And, and so very beginning, it's just something that you have to do mm-hmm. and, and people don't really take, you know, take a lot of you know, value into it. But as they get bigger, they realize the importance mm-hmm. of it and uh, how that's going to really help them grow their company to what they need to, to, to get to. Wonderful. So I've got time for two more questions and I was trying to debate what to ask you. But I thought I'm going to ask you a question on success. You know, uh, worked with large firms, built your own firm, obviously uh, highly respected, um, recognized, rewarded, of course. When you look at life, Jody, what does success mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question. What does success mean to me? Um, you know, su- success is just like an it's an ever changing, an ever changing thing. So. Success starts to me with, with goals and, mm. and with goals, you know, whether that's, you know, personal goals, you know, whether that's, you know, I'm getting married, I want to be married for 30 years, a personal goal, you know, there's going to be hurdles along the way, you know, so well, what, what does success mean? It means working around the obstacles, so identifying the goals and then working around the obstacles that you're going to have in life. Because, you know, when starting the firm that we started back in 2002, it's a completely different firm than it is today. You know, it just kind of morphed into, you know, what, what it is today based on the different roadblocks and the different mm-hmm. directions that we had to take, you know, during our journey. Uh, because, you know, when we first started, we had no cash in the bank. And so we had to figure out how to, you know, how, how to run a business with, with very little, with very little capital, which was very, very tough. And so with that, you know, what, what, what do we have to do? We have to figure out, well, is there a different way of billing clients? Yes, there is. And we figured out subscription-based billing was a great thing. So instead of in- invoicing clients, we started actually just hitting their bank account every single month for the exact same dollar amount. So no, no different than a Netflix would do for, for, for um, TV or anything of that nature. So a subscription-based model really kind of solved our, our issue of not having cash. And it, it was just one of those things that a different roadblock hit. You know, then the, then the next roadblock is, well, how do we get clients? Because we've got all this, we, we've, got, we've got this great idea how to get clients. And so then we started focusing on a niche into the uh, you know different industries, and we said, hey, this is the creative agency industry is the industry we want to focus on: web design, web development, mm-hmm. and it really worked out well. We started really seeing a lot of growth in that area, and so then, so the obstacles will happen all the time. In, right. in success, success and failure, it's very small. It's really, are you willing to take that extra step or try to figure out a way around the obstacle? Because mm-hmm. once once you find that obstacle, you can't get get you know get across. You're stuck. You're done. And, and in my view, there's always there's always a way around it. There's always you got to look outside the box, and success will always be an ongoing thing for us. Mm. You know, have we been successful with our company? Yeah, in many people's eyes, probably yes, but we haven't hit our long term goals yet. So we're, we're on our way to success. Wonderful. And the funny part about it is our long term goals keep changing. So you know, three years ago, it was like, hey, let's get to five million dollars, and we're mm-hmm. at five million dollars. Well, that was easy. Let's get now. Let's get to you know seven million dollars. Well, that yeah. do that. And then it's like nine million dollars that we're going to do that this year. It's like, well, now, now the next goal is twenty million dollars. Can we get that done in three years? So that's kind of the success. So as we go through, the journey is going to change. Three years from now, our company is going to be a lot different than it is today, mm-hmm. just because we're going to have to figure out how to grow and to be able to scale the business, you know, based on on that growth. So again, success is an always changing thing, um, but it, it starts with just identifying the goals. You know, what do you want to actually achieve? And then figuring out how, as the roadblocks come up, how to how to get over the roadblocks or how to, to get around the roadblocks to get to that end goal. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And with that, Jody, we've run out of time. So thank you so much. It's been such a privilege speaking to you. Thank you for taking me down your amazing journey with Summit CPA. Uh, thank you for sharing so much of your knowledge and wisdom on accounting and controls and strategies and there's so much more that's happening in the world of accounting thank you and good luck yeah thanks ash it's been fun thank you for listening to the brand called you video cast and podcast a platform that brings you knowledge experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world 
do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.